Well, amen. Hey, welcome uh, to Venture Man. I'm glad that you're here today. Here's the deal. Uh, if you will hang with me for the next little bit, uh, I know, man, I know you want to get ESPN pulled up on your phone. Um, hang with me for the next little bit. i get you out of here quicker than a rain delay, okay? That's my promise to you. Um, <clears throat> hey, look, here's where I want to start, all right? Uh, I, I want to start before we go anywhere else. I want to show you a picture. Uh, you've probably heard about this. I'm sure you have, but I want you to see it. Uh, here is a picture of uh, over a hundred, over a hundred of our um, high school students and leaders who left out this morning. This was a training earlier the week. This picture is, is a training from earlier this week. They've spent the last three or four weeks training for uh, the trip that they began today. They are, as we speak, on their way um, to serve for the next five or six days or so. Um, they're going to be serving some children and some families in some very under-resourced areas of Arlington, Texas. And so, man, I see this picture. I want you to see it uh, because one, man, it just, it does my heart so good. Like it just, it fills my heart with encouragement and, and excitement to see um, so many stories that's willing to give their time, their talents, their resources uh, to serve people that, man, they, they don't know, they have no clue, uh, but they're willing to love them and serve them well. And so, uh, man, I, I love to see that. Um, here's the other reason I, I want to start with this picture. I want to, for the next little while, man, I want us to talk about our influence and our investment into the generations that are walking behind us. And now for you, that is wherever you are, okay? Well, whatever age group, whatever demographic, whatever generation you put yourself in, um, the, the, the generations that are walking behind you, what it looks like for us to invest well in those people and in those stories. And as we talk about this, here's the deal. We know that there's this kind of just like universal truth that we all tend to operate in that says the generations that are walking behind us are fools, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we all kind of tend to operate, or at least the first place we go mentally is, man, when those kids, right, when those kids that were raised on video games, when those kids that were raised on social media or participation trophies or cell phones or what, like whatever the thing is for you and your generation, when those kids that were raised on that thing that's not you, we're all doomed, right? Like we're all going to be doomed when those kids become adults. And man, I hope they're not my doctor, like that kind of thing, you know? And so here, here, as we wade into this conversation, um, I, I don't want that to be the picture in your mind. I don't want the picture in your mind to be what, what culture, what the world says about those students, those stories, those people, whatever. I don't want the picture in your mind to be, to be Tide Pods or TikTok dances or like whatever the thing is, right, for that generation that's in your mind. I want this to be the picture, right? Like I want this picture of, of 100 students and leaders who are going to give um, the, their week and are very compressed. I don't know if you realize this about summer now, but it is extremely compressed for our students, they're going to give a week of their time to serve someone else. Like, that's the picture I want you to have in your mind. I want the picture in your mind to be thousands and thousands and thousands of, of college students who are gathered for weeks on end on their college campuses to worship God with no agenda. Like, I want the picture in your head to be a, a God who can do uh, indescribably, indescribably, immeasurably more than you and I could ever think or imagine. Because that, that has been the foundation. That, that's kind of been the thing we've been talking about now for the past four, five, six weeks is we've looked at these different figures of the faith, these different like heroes of the faith, the, the Davids, the Marys, the, the Pauls, the people that make it into stained glass windows, if you're tracking with me, right? Like, like the people that, man, when we think about the ones that made the difference, those stories. And when you really zero in on those stories, you begin to realize like they're not hero material. Like there's some of the people that the generations ahead of them would have thought, man, they got no hope, right? Like they, they, these are people with the same sort of sin and struggle and shame that you and I carry. I mean, these are people with the same sort of pain and problems that you and I experience every single day. And yet those are the people that God uses. God uses the ordinary people. God uses the ordinary situations and, and, and circumstances to do extraordinary things, to, to shock the world, to bring about his glory, his power, so people see him and not us. 
And so as we begin to talk about, man, God working in the generations that are walking behind us, I, I want you to understand that while the world, while, while your um, first thought might be to count them out, I want you to see that, that look, as a church, as a people, man, we believe that God is stirring something special in those generations. I mean, we believe that God is stirring something unique and powerful in the lives of our students and the lives of our children. And we want to be a church and we want to be a people that stewards that well. We want to champion the next generation. We want to stand in the gap on their behalf. There's a, a passage, it's a simple verse in Ezekiel chapter 22. The language of it has just, man, it has captivated me for the past several weeks. God is there in, in Ezekiel. God is speaking to um, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, and he's talking about the, the sin and the struggle and the shame that the, the Israelite people had been walking through. And, and God says that he's been looking for someone that would build the wall around them, that he's looking for someone that would stand in the breach, would stand in the gap on their behalf. And he says, because I find no one, the people have to walk through judgment and pain and my hope, man, our hope, our prayer is that you and I, that we would be a people, that we would be a church that's willing to stand in the gap, stand in the breach for the generations that are walking behind us. That, that we would be a people that would build the wall, that would build the church in such a way that, that the students, that the children walking behind us can stand on our shoulders, can see further, can see higher than you and I could have ever imagined. Man, I want us to be a place, we, we want to be a place where, where we build the foundation in such a way that, that our children, that my daughter can experience victories in her faith and her fellowship that I never got to experience because in that, the kingdom wins and the glory of God is known. And so I want to take you to a place um, where, where we see the story of a man named Timothy. Now, Timothy, if Timothy's name sounds familiar to you, it's because there's a couple of letters in the New Testament that's written to Timothy, not by Timothy, but to Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, real creative in names. That's going to be our main text. We're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 in just a minute. That's where we're going to start, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. But we first see Timothy way back in Acts chapter 16. We read it a few weeks ago in our reading plan, if you're following along with us there. But in Acts chapter 16, uh, the author of the book of Acts, Luke, Luke tells us that Timothy comes from somewhat of a broken home. And I say it that way because we're not exactly sure what Timothy's home life looked like. We don't really know like the marital status of his, his mom and his dad. Here's what we know. We know for sure Luke tells us that his mom was a believer and his dad was not. We know that his mom had influence in his life and his dad did not. We know that Timothy followed in the way of his mother. He began to follow Jesus, that he was well known for that. And when the apostle Paul, who kind of steps in as a spiritual father in Timothy's story, when, when Paul writes about the influence in Timothy's life, he only writes about his mother and his grandmother, but never his father. And so we get the picture. We, we begin to understand that, that Timothy's dad wasn't involved in a story. He wasn't really around for Timothy. The um, U.S. Census Bureau, you might know this, um, the U.S. Census Bureau said just last year, 2022, just last year, that one in four children are being raised in a home without a father figure. And that's an issue. Here's why. Because statistically, children who are raised in a home without a father figure are far more likely to face emotional, physical, spiritual, mental struggles. And now listen, there are a lot of single moms who are doing an incredible job. My mother is one of those people. I, I, I've said this many times from this place. Like part of my story is my mother, not by her choice, my mother had to raise two children on her own. Right? So like I get that, I understand, and there's some single moms who are doing an incredible job. But listen, I'll tell you this, as much as my mother loved us, as much as my mother cared for us, man, did everything she could for us, there were still people who stood in the gap for us. As children, man, there were people um, at, at church, we grew up in church, that, uh, you know, our Sunday school teachers, RAs, GAs, if you're about that life. Like, there were people who stood in the gap for us. There were friends, uh, their parents, right, who I just kind of wandered to their house every now and then. Parents that, like, they weren't responsible for me, but, man, they loved me, and they cared for me, and they, they encouraged me, and they walked alongside me. They walked alongside my mom and my sister. They stood in the gap on our behalf. I mean, that made an incredible difference in our story. 
This is a thing, man. One in four children being raised without a father figure in their home. It's an issue, but it's not an issue that the church can't stand in the gap on. It's not an issue that the church can't address. Man, I, actually, I think we should, like we're called to, and we're equipped to be a place and to be a people that stands in the gap on behalf of our children. And so Timothy, um, Timothy's kind of raised in that dynamic. His father's not really involved. The apostle Paul comes along, kind of stands in the gap. He, he serves like a spiritual father. He even calls Timothy a spiritual son. So he stands in the gap in Timothy's story. He invites Timothy into his story. He brings him along. He, he shows him what it looks like to, to evangelize, to disciple, to plant churches, to raise up leaders. Like he pours into Timothy's story, he stands in the gap for him. And this is where I want to pick up Timothy's story. Paul eventually kind of sends, he, he commissions Timothy to be the pastor in the city of Ephesus to lead the church there. And the first Timothy is a letter by Paul, his spiritual father, to his spiritual son, Timothy, who is standing in the gap on his behalf. He's coming alongside him with words of encouragement and instruction and guidance. First Timothy chapter four, let me show you this. Let's start in verse 11. First Timothy chapter four, verse 11. It says, command and teach these things. Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, for your age, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. We'll come back around that. Um, verse 15, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see you progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, one of the lessons we draw from Timothy's life is that age does not qualify or disqualify you, okay? That according to your age, your age is not a qualifier or a disqualifier. Here's what's fun for me in this conversation, okay? I am, uh, well, I will be in a few, few months. I will turn 35, which means I'm kind of in that weird no man's land of like, am I old, am I young? We really don't know. We get like five years here, right? Where you're kind of in the gap and you can just be whatever. And so th there are people, here's why I say that, because there are people who are 20 years younger than me in this moment, like see a little gray beard, gray, gray in my beard, who like see me here 35 and think, like I'm one bad sneeze away from the nursing home. <laughs> and I feel like that sometimes. I don't know how I slept that night. And, and then there are some people who are 20 years older than me who like right now are getting ready to like, boy, I done forgot more than you learned, right? I said that earlier and somebody shouted, amen. So depending on kind of like where you are on the gap, you see me as young, you see me as old, it's fine, okay, I can be whatever. I'm okay with that right now. Um, and so you, look, you get mad at me on either side of the equation here, but the reality is that just because you're young doesn't mean you should not lead or you should not have influence. As a matter of fact, we all have influence, whether you see it or not. And for that matter, just because you're old doesn't mean that you should lead or have the kind of influence you have. Age does not qualify or disqualify you. Paul says to Timothy, a spiritual son, man, don't let anybody despise you. Don't let anybody look down on you because of your youth, because you're young, because of your age. We don't really know exactly how old Timothy was. Some people think he's probably about 30. Some people think he's probably about 20. Either way, we know that Timothy is younger than the people he's leading. We see that in, in his words, in Paul's words, like don't let anybody look down on you because of that. He's younger than the people he's leading, which we know kind of causes a little bit of, of doubt in Timothy's life. You can see that as you read through the letter, there's some doubt in this calling that he struggled with. And Paul is standing in the gap. He's coming alongside him to speak encouragement and guidance to him. Here's what I want you to see in that. Timothy is simultaneously in this moment, he is simultaneously learning and receiving from Paul and then teaching and leading and giving the people of Ephesus. So there's never this moment where Timothy, as this young believer, this young leader, there's never a moment where Timothy graduates or moves on from learning to leading. There's never a moment where he's learned enough. There's never a moment where he's led enough that he doesn't have to do the other. The two go hand in hand. And I say that to you to say this, regardless of our age, we've got to understand we all have influence. And the reality is what you're allowing to influence you is directly related to how you will influence other people. What you receive is what you'll give. And so what that means for us is that, listen, you cannot take in garbage and expect to give out glory. 
It's not how it works. You can't receive garbage all day long. You can't take in trash all day long and expect your story and your influence to be a glorious one. That's not how it works. And so you need to pay attention to. I'm not just talking to young people. I'm talking to all of us. You need to pay attention to the influence that you allow in your story, in your mind, what it is that you're allowing to guide and direct your thinking. It might surprise you how much is out there that you're allowing to influence you. And so Paul kind of comes along with this, this instruction, this guidance to Timothy. Now, now listen, one of the ways, okay, one of the ways we're going to protect the purity and the power of the local church, and hear me say, man, I believe in the power of the local church. Man, I love this thing. Like, I, I truly believe it is God's ordained instrument to bring about change in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Okay, I love this place. And one of the ways we're gonna protect the purity and the power of the local church is by learning from the generations that are walking ahead of us and teaching the generations that are walking behind us. Go back and read any of the Old Testament, maybe not any of it, go back and read something like Exodus, Judges, 1st, 2nd Kings, don't jump straight into Lamentations or something like that. But go back and read some of those stories and man, you'll see, you'll see that when the people of God get this right, they find blessings. And when they get it wrong, the wheels come off the bus. Every time God's people experience disaster in the Old Testament, it is because the older generations quit teaching the younger generations and because the younger generations quit learning from the older generations. You know that um, Barna, the Barna Group, one of the most like a reputable, re respected uh, research groups, research organizations, faith-based research groups. Barna says that 70%, 70% of 18 to 29 year olds no longer attend church regularly. That's a lot. If you're not really good at picturing numbers, what that really means, okay, hold up 10 fingers, put seven of them down. That's how many. That's how many of our 18 to 29 year olds are left being influenced by the people of God. Being in a place where the people of God, the glory of God, the gospel of God, the hope of God can stand in the gap on behalf of their story. Listen to me, there's an entire generation that is walking away from the church and is walking away from the faith because honestly, because they are bored with the faith that they see in the generations ahead of them and their parents and their grandparents, they are bored with a faith that is unwilling to inconvenience itself for vision and mission. Our students and our children, like they've actually believed us when we've told them, faith is supposed to drive you to the uncomfortable. Faith is supposed to stretch you. Faith is supposed to take you away from the things that you consider comfortable. They've believed us and then they've watched us live out a comfortable faith and they want none of it. Gen Z, Gen Z, one of uh, that kind of like 20 and younger, depending on where you draw those lines, uh, Gen Z is, is considered to be one of the most spiritually curious generations to ever exist. That's good news. It's good news because they're asking questions. It's good news because they know there's something more. They want something more. They're asking questions. They're searching for it. The problem is they're not finding answers in the older generations that are walking ahead of them. There have been books and articles to no end written about youth and kids who are deconstructing the faith. You wanna know why they're deconstructing the faith? Because they've been handed a faith that needs deconstructing. You realize that for the first time in the, the history of the Church of the West, and again, I'm, I'm talking about like our reality, the West, Right? Like there, there are places around the world, particularly where persecution is the, the worst, that the church is just exploding with God's glory. But in the West, in our reality, for the first time, the church no longer holds the moral high ground. What that means is like if you are 40 or older, then the majority of your life, the church was considered morally right. Like even if somebody wasn't a believer, even if somebody didn't go to church, they wanted to be associated with Christians, they wanted to do business with Christians because they at least thought we would do the right thing, right? Like we at least held that moral high ground. But if you're 20 or younger, the opposite is true. 
We no longer hold the moral high ground. And so what that means is at least the loudest voices, I'll say that, I won't say all, but I'll say the loudest voices culturally, the loudest voices no longer consider us to be morally right. The Christian church is considered to be hateful, bigoted, backward. And so you've got to understand Listen, we've got to understand that the generations that are walking behind us, they are not fighting the same battle. The battleground is different for them, which means that for you and I, I'll put myself in the older category. I'll shoulder the weight I need to shoulder in this. It means for you and I, if we are not handing a faith off to them that is stronger, that is more deeply connected to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, then they will fight battles ill-equipped and unprepared. And listen, That's on us. You say what you want to about the effects of cell phones and social media. I know I've read the research. I get it. But for them to have to fight battles in their faith unprepared, that's on us. So what do we do about it? That's the intro. Everybody ready? We're going to get to the points. We're going to roll it up. Okay. How do we stand in the gap? What does that look? What do we learn from Paul's relationship with Timothy how do we, man, how do we teach the generations that are walking behind us? How do we learn from those that are walking ahead of us? Let me give you three things we see in Paul's communication, Paul's letter to his spiritual son, Timothy. Here's the first thing. If we're gonna stand in the gap, it is going to require patience. You gotta be patient with it. Be patient in the process. Let me show you. Um, let me go back to uh, the last two verses we just read, 1 Timothy 4, verses 15 and 16. Let me give you three words right here. Okay, circle them, underline them, uh, Take a mental picture, whatever you need to do. Um, Three words. Paul says, verse 15, practice these things. Practice. We're talking about practice. The whole idea with practice is that you're not going to get it right. That's why you practice. You take the cuts. You run the drills. You play the songs. You practice because you're not going to get it right every time. But when you practice and you get it wrong, there's somebody that loves you. There's somebody that cares for you that's able to give you guidance so you can do it right the next time. You practice. You practice so that you might progress. That's where he ends that verse. Practice so that others may see you progress. That's the second word, progress. 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 Paul said, um, same guy who wrote this letter, Paul said, I think it was to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians. He says that we are transformed into the image of God one degree at a time. One degree is slow. It is a slow process of change. It is slow to progress in the image and the glory of God. But slow can be powerful. You builders, you know, right? Like one inch, one degree At the beginning of a project, it doesn't really feel like that big of a deal. But the further you get into the project, that one inch, that one degree becomes really important. One habit, one tweak in your story now might not feel like that big of a deal, right? I'm gonna go to church one more time this month. I'm gonna read one chapter. I'm gonna read just a couple of verses every morning of scripture. I'm I'm gonna pray three minutes every morning. Like that might not feel like a big deal. That one habit, that one degree might not feel like a big deal now, but in a decade, that degree will radically transform your story. But it's progress. It's slow, one inch, one degree at a time practice so that little by little you progress, begin to look more and more like Jesus. And then verse 16, Paul, the spiritual father, tells his son Timothy, hey, listen, you're going to have to persist. Persist in these things. Don't give up because you're going to want to. You're going to get it right. Practice is not going to feel good sometimes. Sometimes that progress is going to feel way too slow and you're going to want to give up. Persist. And when you begin to hear these words, practice, son, progress, you're going to get there, it's okay. Persist, I see it, don't give up in you. When you see these words coming from a spiritual father to a son, I mean, you see the patient heart of a father. Like I wonder, I mean, I wonder if our, if our students, if our children, it, it, if they're quick to bring us As adults, if they're quick to bring us their flaws, their failures, their inconsistencies, because they know we'll have a patient heart towards them, we'll care for them in the process, or if they sit in that shame because they think we're just gonna heap it more on them. I mean, if we're gonna stand in the gap, we're gonna have to do so with a heart of patience because listen, you don't get it right, 
they're not going to get it right every time either. We've got to help them practice. We've got to help them progress. We've got to help them persist one degree at a time. Here's the second thing. If we're going to stand in the gap, it's going to require presence. We've got to actually be there with them if we're going to stand in the gap. We can't shout from the other side of the house, I'm with you. No, we've got to be there with them. Look, at, um, if you flip over a page, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, same guy writing to the same son. He says, you, however, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, and he keeps going. The point is, Paul is saying in the first letter, he said, hey, you go set them example and don't let them look down on you because you're young. And then he tells us here, the whole reason he can tell Timothy with confidence, go set them an example is because Paul's already given him an example. He brought Timothy into a story and he said, you watch me, come along with me, watch me follow Jesus. Now go show them. I mean, this is one of the things I've been incredibly convicted and challenged on. Because I, but I really believe that as a whole, we would be far more confident in the faith of our, our young people and the faith of the generations behind us, of our students and our children. We'd be far more comf or confident in the faith that they were living out if we were more confident in the example we set for them. Like I really think there'd be far more students and children bold in their faith if there were more old people who had been confident and bold in their faith. Paul said, you've come along with me. You've been in my story. I've been in your story. You've seen the example. Now you can go set them an example. Here's what uh, presence does, two things. Presence gives you the ability to call out potential. I can still see the picture. I shared this story a couple of times. Um, West Laurel Baptist Church, first church I ever had the opportunity to serve at. My wife, Brooke, is her home, her home church where her and her family uh, went. But uh, I, can, I can still see the picture being there. There's a man about second or third pew on the right-hand side, Mr. T.D. Mr. T.D. always sat in the same spot because he couldn't see to go any further back. He had to sit up close. And right there beside, he always sat at the end of the pew so that he could park his hover round right there in the aisle because he couldn't walk either. And there in the pew with him was his oxygen tank that you could hear every 30 seconds going off. <laughs> Man couldn't see, man couldn't walk, man couldn't breathe. But he made the people of God a priority. And I can remember the day this man grabbed Brooke and, and he told her, you are gonna do something special. I see it in you, God's told me, you're gonna do something special. And listen to me, that marked her. A simple statement from a caring person in church marked her. We still talk about it today. It was kind of one of those defining moments for her, for us, because this 80-year-old man looked at this 20-year-old female and spoke something, called out potential in her. Listen to me, you can do that. Like, that's not hard. It's not hard to, to gra don't physically grab a student, maybe, maybe it don't matter. It's not hard to look at a student in the eyes and say, man, I see something special in you. Man, I'm proud of you. Hey, you might have messed up back there, but man, I'm still with you. It's okay. But you can't call out what you don't see. And you can't see it if you're not present. The presence gives you the ability to call out potential because presence changes your perspective. Presence gets you in the posture where you can see what's happening in their stories, in their situations, in their lives. I, listen, I am, I am begging you. Like I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you. I would get down on my hands and knees right now, except Craig did it a couple of weeks ago and talked about how awkward it made everybody feel. Okay, so I'm not gonna make you feel awkward. I'm begging you. Show up and be present in the lives of people in different seasons and stages of life than you. Be present. Look, there's a lot of ways to do that. One of the ways one of the ways that looks probably, what I would say the most important way that looks at Venture Church is, is house church. 
Because at House Church, man, we want to give you a space on Wednesdays where you are present with people, not that just look like you, not the people in the same stage of life as you, but people who live around you, which means you're going to be in a living room with people who are 80, who are 60, who are 40, who have kids, who don't, who are married, who are single. And listen, I, I know that can be tough. I promise. All right, we got some kids in our house church, and look, there is no such thing as a quiet four-year-old. I get it. I know it can be tough. I know it's more comfortable to be with people in the same place as you, but listen to me. Following Jesus is not about finding what's most comfortable. Do you understand that? Like like one of the things Jesus tells us is that, hey, look, it's gonna be difficult, but it's gonna be worth it if you follow. It's just gonna be uncomfortable, but man, it's gonna be worth it. In the past five months, five months, 30 children have been baptized whose families were a part of house church. 30. That's more than one a week. Children whose lives, whose eternities have been changed because they saw their parents interacting with adults who looked like them and who didn't. Saw them interacting with their faith. It's making a difference. Show up and be present. And look, I understand kind of how ill-timed that point is because house churches don't meet regularly in June and July. But look, it's it's not about the season, okay? So you can still sign up. You can still get connected with people. You can still get connected in that community. Show up and be a part. Here's the last thing. If we're going to stand in the gap, we've got to do so with patience. It's going to absolutely require our presence. And we're going to have to pray, (laughs) And I know, I know that might sound like an oversimplification. That's what you're supposed to say in church, but it's the most important thing we could do. As a matter of fact, Paul said, 1 Timothy chapter two, okay? So earlier in, in that first letter, Paul said, first of all then, the most important thing, if you get nothing else, get this. I urge that prayer and supplication, thanksgiving be made for all people. Paul told Timothy, he told his son, look, the most important thing you can do is pray for him. Because prayer is where we see the presence and power of the Holy Spirit coming over people's lives. And here's where I would challenge you. It's not just pray for them, but pray with them. Show up to house church and man, pray with those families and those kids. Sign up to serve in KXP so you're not just praying for that hallway, but you're praying with those children in that classroom. Sign up to serve with movement or the gathering with our high school students or middle high school students or the college students so you're not just praying for them as they go somewhere, but you're praying with them in those moments. Can you imagine how powerful a generation would be if they grew up in a church where adults regularly, consistently put a hand on their shoulder and said, I love you, I see something special in you, and I'm praying with you right now. Generations would be changed. The world would be changed. Because we as a people are willing to stand in the gap on behalf of the generations that walk behind us. So here's what I want to do. Um, Here's how we're going to kind of close out this time. Uh, Typically, uh, and we're going to do this in just a minute, typically we, we close out our time in, in time of worship and give you a chance to kind of move physically, um, respond, get up, move how God leads you. Uh, I want to do something before we get there, okay? I want to get there in a posture of prayer because I really do believe it's the most important thing we can do. And so let me invite you, let's do this. Um, kind of get comfortable in your space, whatever you need to do. Bow your head and close your eyes. Look, if you got kids with you and you're worried about them making noise, we just spent 30 minutes talking about how important they are, so <clears throat> on the people that want to judge you. Right? So it's okay. Bow your head, close your eyes. If you're uncomfortable in this, man, you don't really know what prayer looks like, then I tell you what, consider the next 90 seconds as a gift for you to have enough silence to actually hear yourself think because <laughs> none of us really have that in life right now. I want to give you just a few things to pray for in this space, and then we're going to move into a time of worship and response. So start here. Ask God to show you, begin to think about what it is that you're allowing to influence you and influence your story, who and what it is.
ask God to show you, begin to think about, man, is there somebody in your, story, in your story, is there an opportunity in your story to stand in the gap for someone younger than you? To come alongside them with encouragement, guidance, love. Ask God to show you what's keeping you from standing in the gap. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us. And you can stay right here in this posture if you need to. I'm gonna pray for us and then across all of our campuses, we're gonna step into a time of worship and response. And maybe for you, that response looks like staying exactly where you are, how you are seeking the presence of God. Maybe your response is to move to the crosses or to come to the altar and pray, to take communion, whatever that needs to be. I'm gonna pray for us. Our team's gonna lead us in a time of worship and you respond, you move how God leads you. Lord, we come before you, God, I thank you for your goodness. God, for your presence in our lives that if nothing else, you sent your son to stand in the gap on our behalf. God, you sent your son to stand in the gap, to to hang on the cross, to take our sin and our shame, to take our pain and our problems. Lord, I pray pray that the generations that are walking behind us will see your hope your glory, your goodness in us. God, that you will use us in their stories to point to you. Pray that you'll move and you'll guide us in this time. All things we ask in your name. Amen.